I'm going to start by just telling you a little bit more about who we are and what enabled us to write the book, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about where feminism is from our perspective in the year 2010. And let me know if you need election results. Okay, yes, and we have election results. I see many people have their stickers on, <clears throat> and we, we're so excited because New York is kind of a, a given, like we know who's going to win, so it's fun to be in a state where we don't know. <clears throat> and so. Um, it was exciting that we, we put the date together that it was going to be this election in this state. It was like, well, that's kind of fun where other people are watching. Uh, Jennifer and I, we were both born in 1970, and we were both born in different parts of the country, but what both felt like the middle of nowhere. Jennifer was raised in Fargo, North Dakota, and I was raised in central Pennsylvania, a town called Williamsport. And we were raised in very different households. Um, in terms of sort of the, the circumstance of our household. Jennifer was the middle of three daughters and her dad was a doctor and her mom was a stay-at-home mom and had a relatively sort of conventional family. Her parents fell in love when they were 12 and they're still in love to this day. And That they, part's not conventional. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they, are, they both went to the same junior high and the same high school and the same college. And I grew up in central Pennsylvania and my mother was seven months pregnant with me when she called the medical school where my father was supposedly enrolled, and they said, I'm sorry, he's not here. And she's like, oh, that's okay, you can leave a message. And they said, no, there's nobody here by that name. There never has been anybody. And then that led my mother to sort of uncover this false identity that he had. It wasn't even a false identity. He was using his real name, but the, <laughs> the, the, the details he was giving of his life weren't accurate. And so she left him, and I always knew this to be my story, but I had not realized how radical it was in 1969 to be seven months pregnant and say, I'm going to do this on my own. And she did do it on her own. And so my household grew up with one parent doing two jobs. So from a very young age, I watched my mother sort of play the role of mother and father. And while I think in both of our households, the circumstances of our mother's lives really informed us and them about feminism. It was not so much that they were studying in college and then sort of graduated and sort of made decisions based on that. It was that my mother was a single mother and sort of fighting societal, societal stereotypes of what it meant to be a mother, what it meant to be a working woman, what were her job options, and sort of trying to fight back against that. And I think those circumstances sort of forced her to, to come to a feminist place. Jennifer's mother, though in a more conventional place, was a stay-at-home mother and feeling very invisible all of a sudden. And in, in the same way, sort of felt like, how am I gonna get visibility? And it came from feminism <laughs> that said that the work done in the home should be valued. And so our mothers, like many of other women and men in the early 1970s, turned to Ms. Magazine and conscious raising groups. And my mother had a book club and they read Marilyn French's book, The Women's Room. And Jennifer's mother did too, and they were, starting to discuss these ideas that had previously just been their own life and they felt very isolated and alienated and all of a sudden they were realizing that it was something women everywhere were feeling and connecting to. And so Jennifer and I were raised in these households and were raised sort of with that belief of you can be anything, you can grow up to be, you know, I used to say that I want to be the first woman president of the United States and I've rethought my, my, <laughs> my career goals a little bit, um, but it was being empowered with that, with that sense of I can do anything, which is not what our mothers were raised to believe. They weren't raised, they could believe anything they wanted to be. And so I think we were the first generation really raised with that sense of entitlement that we were allowed to take up space and do things um, that had previously been shut off to women and girls. And I, from a very young age, was an athletic kid, and so I was playing on sports teams, and I was also one of the rare girls that was good at math and sciences, and so for my generation, I would be in, the only girl in advanced math and science classes. And so kind of like my mother's circumstances, I started identifying not in a sort of a labeling way as a feminist, but I started identifying these injustices. Like, why do we have to wear the boys' old uniforms? And why do we have to play in the field down the street? And why do we have to watch the boys' games? And they don't have to watch our games. And raising these issues, because they just felt wrong to me. Jennifer was a theater kid, and um, in that context, <laughs> um, was, you know, not, it wasn't theatrics on the stage, but I think it was not averse to sort of engaging in public dialogues a lot, I think, as a consequence of that. And her family, when they were little, had belonged to a Lutheran church, and the, the minister of that church took on a very anti-abortion and anti-gay stance at a certain point in Jennifer's family, motivated in part by Jennifer saying, I don't think we should be here. This doesn't jive with sort of what our values are as a family. And so they left and went to another church. 
and Jennifer's her Barbies were always having abortions and she was <laughs> the, when, by the time she got to high school the Lambs of Christ which is a very anti-choice group was coming to her town to protest and she was going doing escorting into the the clinics and so similarly sort of witnessed these injustices and I always think how did you even know to give your Barbie an abortion when you yeah, were like four and <laughs> like it must have been because her dad was a doctor that was sort of all I could or I watched Cinemax or yes. something <laughs> like what was going on and so Jennifer grew up being very very outspoken in the context of that by the time we both got to college I think which is common for many people um, both of our generation and for your generation, assuming that there's an age gap here for most of us, is that that's when you start to identify, you start to label some of those actions as feminist. And I very much felt when I got to college that it just started, my life started to make sense a little bit, where I was like, oh yeah, that's right, that's why all those things happened, that's why I was sort of the one outspoken person identifying that, and Jennifer too. And by the time we met up in the offices of Ms. Magazine, where Jennifer came to take an internship, and I came because I was working with Gloria Steinem, we started sort of analyzing, and we saw each other out, not because we were like, oh my gosh, my mom read Ms. Magazine, and I, but it became apparent that we both were raised in very similar ways. Um, and it was not only similar for us, but women of our generation, which was growing up with this huge appreciation for all that had been done for us. We knew about Title IX, we knew about Roe v. Wade, we knew that there had been anti-discrimination laws that had been put into place. And we felt a huge appreciation for that, and we felt a huge responsibility to carry on that, that work. We also felt a huge frustration because as younger people sort of working in those realms, we felt like sometimes when we would say, oh, you should put Ani DeFranco on the cover, or you should do a story about trans, this transgender person, they were like, um, what are, what's feminist about those things? And they were really the culture of our times, and they were speaking to issues we were identifying, but we were getting this sort of pushback, and we felt we had to justify our lives so much more than we felt that maybe women of another generation had to. We had to kind of prove over and over again what it was that made us feminist and what it was that made us activist. And so it made us very aware of ways that that it was feminism was being expressed differently for our generation. And so when we, we sat down to write Manifesta in, in 1997, that wasn't published until 2000, we sat down to identify where the feminism was. And what we found was that it wasn't that people lacked a connection or a passion toward feminism, but there really was basic confusion about what it meant to be a feminist, precisely because so many of us had grown up with these opportunities that it was harder to see where the barrier was. In another generation, there really was the sign on the door that said, do not enter, you know, no blacks allowed, no women allowed. And so getting past that barrier seemed like a very obvious goal, and people could unite around that. In our generation, the sign had been taken off the door, but yet we still felt that there was inequality, and we still felt there was pressure, and so how were we identifying it? And unique, more unique to our generation, I think that people started to take feminism and farm it out to different places. Whereas our mother has sort of practiced feminism and what I like into like an after-school activity from like three to five, or when they were to now meeting or when they were reading Miss Magazine, their feminism was very sort of compartmentalized into those moments of their lives, and they could felt, feel very empowered in those places and in those moments, but it didn't necessarily help them when they went to the AMP supermarket or didn't necessarily help them when they went to their job at Walmart. And in our generation, I think we identified that, and so it was, okay, we're taking the feminism with us wherever we go. It was more portable. And that, I think, left women of another generation concerned because it was like sleeping with the enemy. And so I felt like Jennifer and I had to do a lot of sort of negotiating about what it meant to be a feminist in 1997. And we say this a lot that when we went to write the book, we went and we sort of like assumed that the other person knew what feminism was. And I got so many Ask Amy's at the time that were sort of like, what is feminism? And at first I was like, are these people dumb? I mean, what am I supposed to do, their homework for them? And I realized that I didn't have a good answer. And neither of us had a good answer. And so we initially went to the dictionary where feminism is defined as the full move, the a movement for the full social, political, and economic equality of all people. And so we, we used that definition to sort of form our basis for feminism. It felt like a complete definition to us. And then we realized shortly in writing the book that it wasn't complete enough, that there was still some confusion. Because when you gave that definition, like 90% of the people said, yeah, sure, I'm a feminist. So then why do people have such a resistance to feminism if they knew the definition? And so we expanded that to say that feminism was putting the emphasis on the ability to make choices, not so much on the choice you made. 